If you spent $200 on a Mind and Fly quadcopter, how good would it really have to be for you to feel like you got your money's worth? What if you spent $900 on a Bind and Fly quadcopter? How much better would it have to be for you to feel like you got your money's worth? That's the question that we are tackling today because we are looking at the $200 iFlight Sedora SL5E and we're putting it head to head with the $900 Mr. Steel signature build from Lumineer and GetFPV. And no matter what you might be thinking right now about these two quads, whether you're thinking that a $200 bind and fly has surely just gotta be a piece of crap that isn't even worth looking at, or whether you're thinking that a $900 bind and fly is an overpriced ripoff that can't possibly bring anything special to the table, no matter what you're thinking right now, I actually think this video has some surprises in store for you. I know it did for me. I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're going to learn something today. Let's unbox these two quads as if you had just bought them and see how do they come and what do you get. Here's the iFlight and it comes with a couple of sets of props. We got some stickers. We got uh, the printout of the flight controller wiring guide. And of course here is the quad. Joystick for the camera, a spare set of screws. These are antenna uh, tubes, a spare set of motor nuts, and oh, and a little 3D printed, I think, yeah, 3D printed plastic nut for the SMA, but let's just save a gram and not include that. The steel quad, on the other hand, just comes in a get a BV box. And when you open the box, it's just sitting there on top of the box. In the box is a warranty card for the frame. The Apex frame does have a warranty. These are the spare motor pants to help protect the motors. Uh, they weigh a tiny bit more, but they go up around the side of the motor just a little more. A set of Ethics watermelon props. Two sets of Ethics watermelon props. Um, spare plastic hardware. Uh, this is the black hardware. Uh, it comes installed with this Coyote Brown hardware, but you can swap it for black if you prefer. Now that they're out of the box, let's get one thing out of the way and put them on the scale. And the Steel Apex, with no battery obviously and no GoPro, comes in at 338 grams. Let's put a battery strap on there, 342 grams. The iFlight comes in at 358 grams. It doesn't have the foam, but it also doesn't have a receiver. So with receiver, it's at about 360. That should get you in the ballpark. I gotta say, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that as much as I would think, well, I'm, I'm a YouTuber and I'm not impressed by anybody. I was really impressed when I first took it this out of the box. It is just so obvious from the first minute you look at it, that a whole lot of thought has gone into how this goes together. Um, for example, uh, my favorite feature, probably of the whole thing. Right here you can see the video transmitter antenna coming out the back of the quad. Here on the Sedora you can see they've got the SMA connector outside the frame. And that means that when the antenna takes a hit, the SMA connector takes some stress. By mounting the SMA connector inside the frame, you protect it from any kind of stress in like an impact. The flight controller is not mounted on gummies, but these are vibration isolating standoffs. And uh, so it does have some shock absorption. We've got the receiver here on the back. It is a crossfire receiver. It's mounted with 3M double-sided tape. It's a little difficult to get the camera in here, but one thing I notice is that the video transmitter is mounted to the top deck, again, with double-sided tape. I always try to avoid mounting things to the top deck of my builds so that when I want to do a repair, I can just take the top deck off and have the whole thing sort of laid bare before me. It's also worth pointing out that it does not come with smart audio activated. And I asked Steele, well, how do you change channels? And he said, well, I just fly on the same channel all the time. I don't know, you need to change channels, like stick a screwdriver up there or something. Uh, I gotta say for $900, I would have hoped that it would have come with smart audio working. 
Up here in the front, we've got Steele's famous foam pad. I say famous, that just used to be the way that everybody mounted their GoPros, because back in the day, almost nobody had a 3D printer because 3D printing hadn't really been invented yet. Nowadays, most people probably would use a 3D printed GoPro holder, and given the popularity of the Apex frame, I'm sure there's tons of them out here. Here's another little touch which I just noticed, and I think a lot of people will appreciate. Up here we've got a USB port. I think it, I think this must be the OSD board, because it sits between the video transmitter and the camera. Uh, on the KISS builds, the on-screen display is handled by a separate board as opposed to being built into the flight controller. So you would configure that using a different USB port. And this USB port has come with a little plug. I guess given how close it is to the props, they're a little worried that stuff will get stuffed in there or get in the way. That's a really nice thought. So here's the stack screw on the Apex. And normally that would come all the way through out the bottom so you could like have access to it. But the bottom plate actually covers it up. Okay guys, I just looked and no, I'm not crazy. The stack screws are inserted as part of the install process and then are not accessible afterwards. In other words, you have to take this whole bottom plate off to get at the stack screws if you needed to for any reason. Uh, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 10 screws and your arms would all fall off and everything. That's kind of, in fact, even on the install guide, they say, make sure to cinch these down so they don't rotate while you're installing your stack. Like, what if you didn't? That's, uh, I mean, I can see why you wouldn't want to make additional holes in your bottom plate, but not having the stack screws accessible, that's a really surprising decision. I would really drive, the, drive me crazy the first time I needed to get at them, and I had to take my whole bottom plate off. Here's the Sedora SL5e, and it's going to be a little harder to find interesting things to talk about on this frame because this is a little bit more of a traditional, like well executed, but it's not trying to like shake things up or do anything really novel. Now on iFlight's bind and flies, they place the receiver up underneath this plastic 3D printed piece. It goes on the top plate. And as I said before, I'm not a big fan of stuff that attaches to the top plate, but actually that's not quite true because the top plate just lifts off the top here and the 3D printed piece will just hold the receiver right where it needs to be. By mounting the receiver up against the top plate there, but not actually attached to the top plate, you can actually get at the bind button, you just have to mount it so the bind button is accessible through one of these holes. You can see the LEDs and it's kind of the best of both worlds. On the iFlight, the XT60 wire comes through this hole in the back and that is a great way of making sure that the XT60 doesn't end up in the props. But if we look inside the frame, we can see, well, I hope you can see, that there is no strain relief on this whatsoever. So if you're flying, and you eject your battery, it's just gonna tug. And the fact that it goes through this hole probably means that it is not gonna stress the ESC pads too much. The concern here is that when the battery ejects, if the XT60 hangs on, eventually over time, you can just rip the pads right off the ESC and ruin the ESC. I always prefer strain relief on my XT60. And if we take a look at the Mr. Steel quad, you can see that they have put a little zip tie here. Um, I probably would like a little bit of a heavier zip tie. This little zip tie, I think, is going to rip off pretty easily in a crash, in a particularly vigorous crash, but it is good to know that they had the thought to do that. And that also is going to help keep this out of the props. It's very close here, but yeah, the frame kind of tucks in right here, and this tucks up here and will stay out of the way of the prop. Both of these frames come with skids or feet or protectors on the underside of the arms. In the case of the Mr. Steel Quad, they are injection molded and quite hard and I, I would bet pretty durable. In the case of the Sedora, they're 3D printed and I think that's TPU. So that's flexible and it's not gonna shatter, but it is gonna grind away pretty quickly if you're like flying on asphalt or concrete. It'll probably do okay on dirt. 
In the case of the apex, they also extend the guard to the outside of the arm, so the edge of the arm, which always takes a lot of damage. That's the first part of any frame that goes, is the tip of this arm. So they extend it out to the edge there to give it some additional protection, and you could presumably just replace these instead of having the end of your arm delaminate and so forth. Look at the arms on the eye flight versus the arms on the apex, and notice that the arms on the apex are tapered, whereas the arms on the eye flight are parallel. This is stronger than this because a tapered arm is going to sort of redirect force into the base, whereas a parallel arm, parallel sided arm, is going to just be more likely to snap off. And Pulse RC knows what they're doing. Now let's talk about the motors, and I have a feeling I'm going to piss some people off in this segment. The Sedora comes with iFlight Zing E motors, 2207 in size, 1800 kV. And I think a lot of people out there know that iFlight makes some of the best motors you can get. They are not like premium brand motors, they're just really good freaking motors. For example, iFlight motors have this bushing built into the top bearing that helps protect the bearings from vertical impacts and just makes the bearings last a little bit longer. The Zing E brand is almost identical to their top of the line Zing brand, but with um, it has a hardened steel shaft instead of a titanium shaft. And it, the bell isn't quite, it's like they have a one piece bell on the, the Zing and it's not a one piece bell on the Zing E. The Zing E, in other words, even though it's like only a $14 motor, has a lot of the stuff that makes Zing motors so freaking good. The Ethics Stout motor is a little harder to judge. And the reason I say that is because people love Mr. Steel so much and they love the products that he makes. And it's hard to separate the signal from the noise from the people saying these are amazing motors. Whether Let me put it this way. When somebody says Zings are amazing motors, they, 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 what other reason could they possibly have? But when people say steel motors, they love them. It's hard to separate the man from the product. Um, as far as specs go, the specs on the Stout motors are, well, so the 2306, 1750 kV, N52 magnets, the same as the Zing E's, 9 by 4 by 4 bearings, the same as the Zing E's. Uh, the steel motors have NSK bearings, which are some of the best bearings you can get. Uh, the, the Zing, I should double check, I shouldn't guess. Holy crap, the Zing E's also have NSK bearings. So the same bearings between them. So I think these are both actually pretty comparable motors. Obviously, we're going to see how they fly. And obviously, we can't know much about durability without data that we don't have access to. How many of them do people break? You know, we'd have to fly hundreds and hundreds of them and say, I think these are actually pretty comparable motors, despite the fact that the steel motors are $27 and the iFlights are $14, $15. Once again, a little difficult to get this in camera, but the iFlight has shipped with a big honking capacitor installed on the XT60 leads. It looks to me like it's 50, it's a 3M 1936. It's a big honking capacitor. The Steel Quad doesn't have a capacitor on it. And this is actually something that people suggested that I fix. People reached out to me and said that the FETs on the KISS ESC are only rated for 30 volts. And that means if you're running 6S, which this quad is designed for, that you're going to be nominally up to about 25 volts. And of course, voltage spikes will take you over the voltage rating of those FETs. I reached out to GetFPV. And they said, that's exactly how steel builds it, and we haven't had any problems. And I reached out to steel, and he said, that's exactly how I build it, and I haven't had any problems. So I am not going to install a capacitor on this guy, even though some people have said that they would, uh, because my intent is to fly these guys as delivered and evaluate them as delivered. But I do want to acknowledge that I did ask the question, and if when I go fly this, it lights on fire, I did ask the question. Now let's get to the part that you are probably the most interested in. How do they fly? And we're going to start with the Mr. Steel build. And if you're like me, you're probably thinking that this is drastically marked up just because it's got a famous pilot's name on it. But when you actually fly it, it's pretty much just going to be like any other quad. And 
That's what I kind of half expected. But I am happy to tell you that that is not true. This is a really special quad. What makes it so special? The first thing that stood out to me about this quad was how amazing the throttle control was. The best way I can think of to demonstrate this is to imagine yourself doing a great big drop from a big height down to then fly underneath a low obstacle so that you've got all this downward speed and then you need to raise the throttle and hit the exact right throttle position to stop your fall but you need to not sort of overshoot and pop up and you need to not undershoot and slam into the ground and that was easier to do on this quad than pretty much any quad I've ever flown. The next thing I noticed about this quad was that I just felt so much more confident flying into areas where I couldn't see where I was going. And it's a subconscious thing that I do that I never noticed before until I found myself not doing it while I was flying this quad. Normally, I'm kind of looking for my exit line. I'm trying not to get too close to that obstacle that's right in front of me because I don't trust my reaction time. Or maybe it's better to say I know what the limits of my reaction time and I don't want to put myself into a situation where I wouldn't be able to react fast enough and I have to crash. But something about this quad had me just diving into these areas, z zipping through obstacles and just feeling confident and getting away with it and not crashing. Mr. Seal commented on my video to say that he attributed that to the lower latency of his CCD sensor camera. And I have never thought of myself as someone who is very sensitive to latency because I don't have a spectacular reaction time. So you give me a little extra latency and who cares? I wasn't going to react very quickly anyway. But the totality of this quad, I felt like I had better reaction time and could fly more confidently into areas where I might crash or something if I was flying a different quad. Now this quad comes with a KISS flight controller and it comes with Mr. Steel's PIDs already on it. And it's hard, having not flown a ton of KISS quads, it's hard for me to know how much of the great flight handling of this quad is the build, the weight versus the flight controller and the tune. But the bottom line is it flew really freaking amazing. The flight feel was quite good. It was very snappy and responsive, locked in any positive adjectives you can think of. It had them. There was the tiniest bit of bounce back on flips and rolls if I really tried to bring it out, but in normal flight, you just never noticed it. And prop wash handling was exceptional, except as the props started to get beat up, the prop wash definitely did come out. And some people are gonna argue that Kiss on a bad day has better prop wash handling than Beta Flight on a good day. Other people have come and said that Kiss is really excellent when the props are pristine, but then falls apart as the props and get sort of beat up, whereas Beta Flight kind of keeps it together a little better. <laughs> We'd have to do a lot of side-by-side -side comparison, but in my experience, very, very good flight handling, very good pit tune as you probably would expect from a quad of this quality. So that's the Mr. Steel Apex build. What about the iFlight Sedora? And honestly, the iFlight Sedora is a way better quad than it has any right to be at a price point of $200. There was a time when if you spent $200 on a quad, you would get a piece of junk that burst into flames or turned itself into a crumpled ball the first time that you crashed it. The iFlight Sedora is a legitimately good quad. And iFlight has clearly put a lot of effort into this quad. They don't ship it with the default Betaflight PIDs like a lot of people would have. They've got custom PIDs on it. They've even activated RPM filtering, which is a thing you can do to make a quad fly way, way better. iFlight has clearly put a lot of effort into making this a good flying quad. No, it does not fly as good as the Mr. Steel build though. Um, going straight from the Mr. Steel Apex to the iFlight Sedora, the iFlight Sedora immediately felt kind of looser, sloppier, um, just less precise, less fine, less honed. Um, and maybe that's because the camera has more latency or maybe that has something to do with the PIDs or the flight controller, but it felt normal though. It's only when you go from something as finely, as refined as the Mr. Steel Quad back to something quote unquote normal that you really 
notice these deficiencies. One thing about the Sedora that I think might contribute to its sloppier feel is the props. It comes with uh, some very, very low pitch props. And I would, I, I mean, I flew them for this test because that's what we're doing and we're flying it as delivered, but it comes with two sets of props. And after you crash and break those props, you're gonna buy something else. I would recommend a higher pitch prop for the iFlight Sedora. Despite all that, I pushed myself to replicate many of the moves that I was doing with the Mr. Steel Quad with the Sedora, and I was able to do them. The difference was that with the Mr. Steel Quad, I just kind of did them when I hadn't really done them before. It kind of just freed me to express myself. And then once I knew what I wanted to do, I could go back to the Sedora and go, oh yeah, okay, I can do that. But it always felt just a little bit like the Sedora was holding me back. But that shouldn't really be read as a mark against the Sedora because we're, we're comparing a kind of an average quadcopter with one of the best, most refined quadcopters in the whole world. The takeaway from this should not be that the Sedora is worse than the Mr. Steel Apex. Of course it is. It had better be at a price difference of $700. The takeaway from this should be that at a price of just $200, Sedora is frighteningly adequate. And that's really saying a lot. One of the areas where I personally would hand the win to the Sedora, but you might disagree, is in their choice of camera technology. The Sedora comes with a CMOS sensor camera, and the advantage of this style of camera is great resolution and great dynamic range. And I feel like these two qualities together give the pilot more information about what's coming at them to make decisions about how to fly and how not to crash. The increased resolution means you can see finer details. The increased dynamic range means that if you're flying into a shadow area or from a shadow area into a bright area, you get more information sooner about what's coming at you. The Steel Quad uses a CCD sensor camera and the main advantage of this technology is that it's lower latency. And I would normally say who, oh, no, who, as long as the latency is low enough, who can really tell? But I felt kind of like I had better reaction time on the steel quad. So maybe there's something to that. The more contrasty image of the CCD sensor does mean that you get a lot of blown out highlights. It's very well tuned for a CCD camera, but there's just some limitations of the technology that can't be overcome. The highlights especially tended to blow out and you would just completely lose detail. Also, the lack of resolution meant that in some areas, like when you were flying through Scraggle or when I was trying to wind my way through the treetops, it was a little harder to see what was coming at me and figure out if I was about to crash. So a little bit of a trade-off there between the lower latency versus being able to see better what's coming at you. The last thing that we have to talk about before we get to the conclusion of this video is durability. And I think you're in for a surprise. Let's look at the iFlight Sedora first. Overall, no complaints about the durability. The one place that I did find damage was right here. These uh, plastic covers seem to be pretty brittle and it chipped and broken. So that didn't seem to do very much, to be honest. I'd probably not even include them if they're gonna be that fragile. The plastic parts on the Apex held up really well. They are hard plastic, so they have taken some scuffs, but they're obviously being hard plastic. They're gonna last a lot longer than the softer TPU on the Sedora. The flip side is that you can't print this at home, can you? You gotta buy more once they, or you could always print a TPU version of it, I suppose, if you want to. So it's more durable, but not quite as replaceable. And the same is true for whatever it is they're making this plastic out of. It held up really well and didn't show any signs of damage. But something happened with the KISS build that means that unfortunately it has to lose the durability challenge. Yep, the ESC popped just like uh, some people said that it probably would. Uh, interestingly, what seems to have failed is not any of the FETs. The FETs all seem fine. What seems to have happened is that one of these little tiny capacitors on the underside of the board failed. It probably failed short circuit, let a current burst through, and that burned out a trace, which means that this 
number two motor, the back left motor, the controller is not getting power. That's my uh, layperson's guess as to what happened. I checked with GetFPV. They assured me that this had never happened before. Uh, so call it the reviewer's curse if you want. I checked with Mr. Steele and he asked me to send him a photo of the mounting holes on the ESC. Mr. Steele files these mounting holes to a larger size so that they take less stress from the screws in a crash. This is why some ESCs come with gummies, even though soft mounting an ESC doesn't really affect flight handling. It's for shock absorption. Um, he suggested that maybe this ESC had not been filed out by GetFPV as much as he would have done it, or maybe not at all. I don't know. I don't see any file marks on there. But he said he files them out, and he's built 30 of these things and has never had this problem. Who should buy the Sedora SL5e? Honestly, anybody. It's such a good value for $200. I can't believe how it almost, but not quite, makes me think, why would I build a quad when I can just buy one for $200? And by the way, if you look at the price of the parts that go into the Sedora SL5e, you're actually saving money by buying them pre... You're getting a discount for the privilege of letting them build it for you. It's just a shockingly good value. So if you're a beginner looking for your first bind and fly, Sedora SL5e for $200, that is a fantastic, fantastic choice if you want a five inch. If you're an intermediate pilot who just wants a kind of good flying mid-range quad, Sedora SL5e, or maybe you'd rather spend $300 on the Sedora SL5, no E, which is the next step up from iFlight. Who should buy then the Mr. Steel Apex Kiss build from GetFPV. There is a buyer for this. Now, at a $900 price point, almost no one is going to buy this. But I know you're out there, people with way more money than time, who just want to know what it's like to fly one of the best flying quadcopters you can possibly freaking get. And if that's you, this is that. I, I, I sincerely mean that. Bear in mind, if you know how to build quadcopters, you can build this exact quad for 600 bucks. You can buy the parts separately or they actually come from TBS in a kit that you build and Mr. Steel has a build video. And if you're half decent at building, you save yourself 300 bucks. It does raise the question we have to ask if the retail price of these parts is about 600 bucks, where does the three hundred more dollars that you pay when you buy the built one from GetFPV go? Because, like, that's a lot of margin, and you know, whatever. If you want to buy it, go for it. And if they want to charge that much, if that's what is worth to them. Fine, but it certainly is a a healthy margin, and it just makes me wonder what I'm missing here. Because if you really get into a groove building quadcopters like this, you can build them in about two hours, maybe a little more than that if you're not quite as efficient. You can really bang them out. And even though they like test fly these, and they do, there was literally blades of grass on this thing when I took it out of the box, I assume from when they test flew it. I just don't know how you get to $300 in labor. And, and you're also making the retail margin on the parts because it's $600 retail in parts. So there's margin there as well. There's a ton of profit in this, but it is really legitimately one of the best flying quadcopters I've ever flown. And more than that, it's really unique. Like, I think that even if you fly freestyle quads or race quads, I don't know if I've ever flown, I know that I haven't ever flown a quad quite like this. When Steele says that this quad is the culmination of six years of research and refinement, and I thought, oh my God, the marketing BS, but I kind of believe it. And I kind of hate myself for feeling that way because I love to take the air out of BS, but I also, tell the truth and it is the truth it's a really interesting and good flying quad whichever of these is the right one for you there are links down in the video description i hope you've enjoyed this video i hope you learned something i hope you got something out of it you can thank me if you've enjoyed it 
by using those links. Click those affiliate links before you make any purchase from one of the affiliated vendors. Whether you want to buy this quadcopter, whether you want to buy that quadcopter, or anything else, just click the affiliate link. Go fill up your cart, make the purchase. I get a small commission, and it definitely does support me. Thank you so much for watching. That's going to do it for this video. Happy flying. What are you doing in here? The least you could do is subscribe or join my Patreon or, like, just here's another video I picked out for you. Jeez.